corporations should buy and sell things in order to you know produce profits in order to make money for stockholders and otherwise should, should simply shut up if we talk to each other and if we trust each other we are amazingly smart and extraordinarily competent and powerful but in order to talk we got to have those social network links the energy and also the food value chains have turned out to be much more robust than i thought that if you could get a central bank that was um focused on low interest rates you would manage to solve the unemployment problem and the income distribution problem at least in the long run decentralization and markets and non-bureaucratic organizations are magnificent and wonderful ways of crowdsourcing solutions to all kinds of human problems you know the problem is that we do not seem to be making terribly good use you know of our enormous technological wealth hello and welcome to another episode of the kv curious podcast in today's episode our guest is jay bradford delong who is an economist at the university of california berkeley Professor Brad has also served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the United States Department of Treasury in the Clinton administration. He is also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research. In this episode, we speak about how the world is slouching towards utopia, what needs to be done in order for us to accelerate the pace at which we head towards utopia, what are some things that both the left wing and the right wing people need to consider and address in order for us to get towards utopia we also speak about a wide range of topics including immigration youth and politics globalization of financial markets uh, globalization in general how to um, improve the participation of uh, youth and citizen in policy making and politics and much more i hope you find this conversation thoroughly insightful and enjoyable thank you for staying with me on the kvq this podcast with professor j bradford dela hi hi professor brad thanks a lot for taking time to chat with me we had a privilege to be hosting you on my podcast oh thank you very very much for inviting me um this is the new global infotech world and so it's wonderful to talk to all kinds of people all around the globe Yeah so may I I want to start with back in 2019 you were of the opinion that neoliberals have no political place left anymore um in 2023 has your opinion changed or uh, what is your perspective at this point you know at the moment the neoliberals last line is that we're not as bad as the other guys you know saying that whatever else is you know whatever other political movements are starting or even less attractive than the neoliberal impulse um was and i confess you know they may well have somewhat of a point um but certainly no one believes you know um in neoliberalism anymore um in the sense that no one thinks it is the road to anything like utopia um at most it's simply a holding action And, and why do you think that's the case why do you think it's not the road to utopia anymore well you know, that is um that the neoliberal impulse which came mostly from the right but also came from the left was that the systems of social democracy had been um over bureaucratized um that there was too much regulation too much telling people what they needed to do too much sorting of people into boxes and treating them as you know identical given that they were in the box and that we really needed a more freewheeling more entrepreneurial you know world yeah that from the rights point of view we needed a lot less in the way of taxes on job creators and entrepreneurs and of regulations um that were usually tuned to the interest of the currently politically powerful um on the left wing it was that social expectations were too rigid you say you saw this perhaps most strongly in the steve jobs's 1984 macintosh computer launch um commercial mm-hmm. where the whole idea was that you were the tool of people who had better information than you did 
and that to actually liberate yourself, you needed to acquire your own liberation. You need to acquire your own information through a personal computer. Um, and, you know, the idea, the general idea that, you know, decentralization and markets and non-bureaucratic organizations are magnificent and wonderful ways of crowdsourcing solutions to all kinds of human problems. You know, while your know, bureaucracies and command and controls, well, you know, well, well, a command and control organization has only one mind at the top, and it turns everyone else into a robot who's just following orders. Mm -hmm. um, and a bureaucracy, well, you aren't following the orders of any one individual, but you're following, you know, the rule book. And so it's not so much that you're a robot obeying commands, but rather you're a... You know, a software bot with a very limited repertoire of possible responses. You know, and neither of those um, seemed very attractive. You know, and hence in the late 1970s, there was this idea that we should move on, you know, from what historian Gary Grissel calls the New Deal order from social democracy to a more freewheeling and entrepreneurial and indeed neoliberal system. The problem is that it didn't seemed to do much except to increase the degree of income and wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. You know, that other promises of what good things it would do for society, you know, it by and large failed to fulfill them. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, at the moment, that leaves people, I think, kind of exhausted because the insights about the value of the markets and decentralization for crowdsourcing still appear to be strongly valid and people keep looking for new ways to try to apply them. But the application does not seem to have succeeded in restoring a more rapid growth of the, the more rapid growth of prosperity that people were expecting. Right. So the, uh, the, I also figured this point when I was reading a book, book uh, called Sl Slouching Towards Utopia. And when yes. you mentioned this, yes. um, you know, rise in inequalities, uh, one thing I want to point out is, OK, it's true that, uh, you know, the parities between the rich and the poor just grew over time. But it's also the true that the poorest in 2023 is much richer than the richest, uh, or let's say at least the poorest oh, yes. in uh, 1800s or 1870s, like you mentioned. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. So oh, it, oh, yes. from that standpoint, don't you think, you know, economic growth is still uh, more sustainable and maybe this parity is an inevitable part of economic growth? Um. I mean, and certainly economic growth, right? The fact that we now are superbly competent at baking, you know, you know, a sufficiently large economic pie that everyone should be able to have enough, you know, by kind of any previous century's definition of what enough, you know, mm -hmm. could possibly. Um, that's certainly true. Um, you know, the problem is that we do not seem to be making terribly good use, you know, of our enormous technological wealth. Um, that, you know, when incomes and wealth are too unequally distributed, you know, um, especially if you have a market society in which, you know, your social power pretty much scales with your wealth, you know, and mm -hmm. only with your wealth. You know, you're producing a world that isn't working for people as a whole or people in general, but just for those who are lucky enough to find themselves to find themselves at the particular top of the pyramid. Um, so it's not so much a belief that we need that we would be better moving back to some previous form of society that is much, much poorer, but it is very much a belief that we're not doing a very good job at all in um, properly utilizing our wealth in order to create you know, a truly human world, a world in which people feel safe and secure and are healthy and happy, um, mm -hmm. that that seems to elude us somehow. Uh, but I, I want to maybe take a step back and dive deeper into this. Uh, when you mentioned that we, we sort of want, have to look at an equitable growth, uh, where the distribution of wealth is rather fair, and this this kind of begs the uh, you know intrusion of principles like uh, universal basic income and rebates that you might have mm -hmm. to offer for the lower mm -hmm. economic strata. So, right. uh, so does they one... seem 
Yeah, sorry. I mean, there are a lot of people who really don't want um, universal basic income, don't want to be given kind of charity by the state or by some large bureaucracy um, based on their status as citizens. You know, that people want to be contributors rather than simply dole recipients. And okay. so what people really want is you know, an opportunity to be useful and to contribute their share and then to have that contribution properly rewarded um, or properly notified or properly registered. You know, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, it is given the fact that social democracy um, did not win universal assent um, I got to suspect that things like UBI are moving in the wrong direction and things like a right to a job right, mm -hmm. um, are, move much, are much more likely to be moving in the right direction. Got it. But when we speak of things like right to job, there needs to be a job provider. How do we bring these job providers and how do we bring in the economic activity to support the, these job providers and these jobs? Well, you know, um, well, what we need to do is we need to find some relatively large class of jobs um, that where it's very clear that they're of um, high social utility, but where the market system is not going to put people to work um, mm -hmm. doing them. You know, which is why things like health care and child care for the not rich um, would seem to be obvious things to do or obvious things that require that people do. Um, problem is that, you know, um, you know, that we need to find this. So we need to find things that will contribute where no one will be upset that you are paying people to do this, that everyone will agree that this is something that's worth doing. Um, but that also, you know, it also doesn't run into the problem of having people, you know, that the people should think that the labor is worthy of its hire. Right. You know, and it's hard to figure out what those kinds of things actually are especially if we're looking at for jobs for males. Um, mm -hmm. That is all kinds of taking care of people and social cementing work. Um, you know, things that tend to have a more female valence in our existing societies. It's easy to find them. Um, and, you know, women have been used for thousands of years to doing things that everyone agrees are socially valuable, but that does not bring in a lot of cash in a marketplace. Um, but, and indeed, the, the problem to the extent that we have an unemployment problem in other than, um, you know, in other than depressions and other than seizures of the economic system. Um, is that we're finding it more and more difficult to find useful things that the, um, shall we say, least socially competent and the you know, most potentially obstreperous part of the male population can actually do that add value. Um, and I think that's the problem with right to a job um, or attempts to push forward to the right to a job. It's hard to figure out what the jobs are for the population that actually needs them the most. True. And when we speak of um, this right to job in, in countries that are not as developed or not first world countries yet, the problem scales up mm -hmm. rapidly, primarily because of the sheer number of people that uh, would want to participate or claim this right of job uh, without the right set of maybe, for the lack of a better word, competencies or skills. That, that would put them in a position yes. or a pedestal to actually perform well in these jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it did used to be, um, yeah, it used to be there were a lot more potential jobs for you know, males who were in some sense, you know, um, 
either socially surplus or socially, um, you know, socially surplus or socially troublesome um, to take. You know, you can always find a boat and you can put them on the boat and have them sail off to someplace else um, as part of the great world trading network. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, much, much harder um, to do that in mass now. Um, and indeed, right, that you have, you know, that the problem is, I suppose, that <clears throat> that we don't have enough jobs for which a relatively unsupervised pair of human hands can do a lot of good without running the risk of doing significant harm by accident. Um, yeah. So, so, so by that um, logic, this is a, a, you know, this is a huge problem um, in figuring out how to run our society. Got it. But but when we speak of um, this particular problem of um, not of having an unsupervised system, do you think centralization sort of becomes the the de facto better option for running the system in a more effective manner? And, and even uh, in terms of the policies that you come up with, uh, be it for uh, reservations or for rebates or for facilities for the lower economic strata, do you think a, a democratic mm -hmm. policy is is much better than letting uh, you know markets decide who should do what and how. Well, you know, it's two different ways of distributing social power as to what should be done with resources and how it should be done. Yeah, and clearly, both have a place. Um, but also, clearly, we, that's simply not enough in the way of instrumentalities. You know, that is. That is, we either vote and a majority decides how this particular resource is to be utilized, or we assign the particular resource to someone, um, call it their property, um, and say it's yours to figure out how to utilize it, provided you can then plug yourself into a social exchange network, you know, so that your utilizing it produces someone willing to pay you for its use and give you the resources you need to live. Um, and clearly, clearly, we need more than that. Um, and what we have more than that so far, we had two other additional things. Um, and the first is large scale philanthropy, right? Someone who has won the game of get rich in the marketplace. You know, deciding to take the accumulated resources that they have been earned, that they have earned in their process of deploying productively the resources they were assigned, and to them have them decide, you know, what to spend it on. Um, and also there's the small scale, right, dumb philanthropy. You know, organizations that hang out their shingle and say our purpose is to do X. Um, who is willing to vote? You know, not democratically in an election, but locally with a small chunk of their resources, you know, that they should contribute to the funding of this particular activity. And my sense is those four really, those four really are not enough. Um, we have a huge problem um, providing enough, you know, getting enough funds to do the research and development we should be doing. Um, Given the large externalities we get from new technological ideas and also from the nurturing of communities of engineering practice. And in a market society, we have an enormous problem of you know getting taking proper account of the poorer quarter or so of the population, you know, simply because the poorer quarter of the population um you know has no social power, because in a market society, your social power is determined by how much your wealth is. And if you have no wealth, you have no social power. Got it. But uh, so when we speak of um, these poor with a rather low social part, one way to really bring them out of these clutches is maybe I would say education. And if that is the case, do you think education needs more focus than let's say uh, survival needs like food or uh, healthcare in some instances or clean water? 
And if we are able to, let's say, um, educate people better, uh, and by educate, I mean formal education, educate in terms of skill sets, uh, they, they would be in a better position to come and participate in the market and uh, you know play along yes. and maybe yes. even bigger. And if that is the case, yes. how exactly do you think should we go about reforming our educational policies so that more people um, can get better quality education um, and in more affordable ways? Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. You know, well, it is hard, you know, and it is hard because you know, um, because our not our degree of social knowledge has now grown such a long tail, right? That do not pay attention when you're ten years old in math class. And you find all of a sudden that huge potential occupations and clusters of occupations, you know, are essentially forever out of reach um, for you. And we have no terribly good way um, of getting back, you know, that is. One thing I've always regretted is that in the spring of my freshman year, I decided I really didn't have time to take the introduction to computer science or the introduction to programming applied math 110 as a fifth course. Um, and um, I was probably right to do so, right? That is, um, if I'd been taking more courses that semester, I probably would not have wound up with what I think was the second highest grade point average in my Harvard class when I graduated, mm -hmm. um, or maybe it was the third. Um, but, you know, if I'd kept um, a whole bunch of additional things would be open to me if I were a better programmer than I am. And mm. yet figuring out how to recoup that failure to take that has been very difficult and I've never really managed to close it. Right. So to an extent, it's also uh, probably the, the limitations of the system where would you say you're your grade point average became a significant metric and had it not been a significant metric uh maybe things would have been different yeah um you know on the other hand you know being one of the junior 12 phi beta kappa my year is was worth something turned out to be worth something later on um in a number of kind of interesting ways um so And there are people who, that is, we really ought to be able to recover, especially because our technologies are changing so fast that, you know, whatever formal knowledge you learned 15 years ago is probably not of much use um, mm -hmm. in whatever your current occupation is. And so you should be able to boost yourself up. And you know, switch jobs um, if you can kind of find the time to do it intensively. You know, um, as Imperial China, right? In Imperial China, there was this. If I've got it correctly, um, when your father died, you were supposed to take a twenty-five month mourning vacation from your job, your career, and then not quite start over again, but almost start over. Um, Mm -hmm. And you know that I think had interesting consequences for career paths. It introduced a great deal of kind of randomness with respect to who managed to eventually get which job, but it also created some flexibility in the system, you know, that we do not now really have. You know, where you know, especially in British Commonwealth-like countries, where if when you choose to do at eleven you know, greatly shapes your options forever. Interesting. And what do you think is the way to, um, I mean, I, I get the point that you've mentioned multiple times that it's hard to recover from these clutches, but if, if any, what yeah. do you think should be one way to get out of it? And not as an individual, uh, but at the scale of 
let's say countries or the world in general it, from not, an economic no. standpoint they do not no especially because students especially young students are not terribly good judges um mm-hmm. of what they want to learn or even of what a very good education is got it so okay let, let's talk about this um when you mentioned that um the, the best way to go about this is not really be uh, decentralized or not the neoliberal approach and um mm. you, when you mentioned that the world seems to be more of what the lefties thought it would be uh what exactly do you mean here and uh why do you think uh, lefties are in a better position to guide how things should move on from here um simply because they're open to new possibilities into the future while yeah the definition of the right wing is in general that things should be as they were or as we imagined you know that they were at some point in the past you know and the problem is that our underlying production communication and domination technologies are changing so fast that there is no way you can go back two or even one generations and find a model for how something works that would actually work today given how different you know the technologies are you know that standing athwart history calling stop you know is just not going to work um and so attempts to do something again you know are just not going to work you know and the other side is at least open to possibilities that we should be doing something new which indeed we'll have to do something new you know if only because the technological basis of doing the old thing is either gone or is soon going to be gone sure but uh, but one thing i would want to ask you is um, maybe it's a very shallow analogy to give but uh, when when we look at um, let's say uh, 1900s where industries were more prominent as opposed to let's say 2020s or, or this decade and the century where uh, more of digital products and digital uh, infrastructure is building up uh do you think there is a growing um demand a growing growing inclination of people to to drift towards digital infrastructure and digital teams primarily because the hierarchy is much lower than it was in the case of industrial era where in industrial era in industries in the shop floor the hierarchy of operations the social hierarchy within the organization was much more prevalent uh which was again not liked by people and which is why they are resorting to more uh digital first or remote first operations uh and which consequently yes. might have um you know also led to let's say elimination of certain uh roles in people's and the snowball effects of those um except that especially as we proceed into a you know um and do what you have to call a second gilded age you know what was a hierarchy of status and ascription because in a world of slow technological and other forms of change you know the it's overwhelmingly likely that the slot for you is going to be very very close to doing whatever it was that your parents did um while now both because of the speed of technological change um and you know that then because you know what you wind up doing has very little to do with what your parents or grandparents you know were actually doing no that that is not possible um not possible at all now you know so you know um you know the problem is that you know the we may well be replaced unless you manage to maintain a relatively equal income distribution um or to somehow have a relatively equal you know distribution of starting points and your know, training and education opportunities yeah that you then wind up with a um a hierarchy not of status or not of ascribed status um but one of wealth you know, which may wind up being as peaked or more peaked 
you know, than the ones of the past. And that, that certainly has less gun social network ties between people who wind up in different classes. Right. This is a very old point. This is Alexis de Tocqueville's point. You know, that the hierarchy in a pre-modern status um, aristocratic society um, is a hierarchy and is brutal and nasty. Um, but there are all kinds of cross-cutting social network obligations you know, that tend to alleviate at least the worst parts of its nastiness. You know, while a market society has very little of that in the way of durable social networks of obligation. Instead, you simply get what you pay for. Um, and you earn with whatever what you produce is worth to the rich. And thus he thought it might well wind up not only you know, um, more unequal, um, simply because to be at the top of a capitalist income pyramid was to take advantage of enormous amounts of dynamism. Um, but also more cruel, precisely because of the absence of, you know, social network ties of obligation running through different pieces of the society. So are you suggesting that the way to move from a status-driven society to a wealth-driven society is to give people their long-pending status or just allow people to improve their status? And uh, uh, in other words, um, take the leftist's approach to eventually become a free market capitalistic world. Well, except that the, the, the leftist approach, it was supposed to be that we would, that the fact that the technologies of production made it so obvious that it was, you, you know, the network, the collective and the technologies that were our common heritage, that was the truly productive thing. Um, that we would, you know, all wind up with relatively strong, you know, social network ties of obligation to each other, simply because we would recognize that others were in a similar situation to ourselves. And that that would heal or cure most of the defects of the market society, in which, you know, you earn only what the market thinks you're worth, and you can have voice and have power in society only to the extent that you have cash to buy things. Um, that it would produce a world that was rich, um, the mar rich even richer than the market economy, um, but also would produce, you know, the social network ties of obligation and thus responsiveness of the earlier societies um, and would do so without inequality. Um, simply because everyone would recognize that it was not the individual who was important, but rather the network and the technology was the common heritage of them all. Um, and that did not work out very well at all. You know, maybe it would have worked out if kind of um, steam power had been the height of technology <laughs> and everyone had been going to work wearing identical blue overalls in large factories where everyone's job was kind of driven by the routines and the requirements of the central steam engine that powered everything. You know, but we moved on from that. And, you know, that kind of egalitarian socialist, we all have very, very common situations and all are viewing the world from the same place, you know, is really not sustainable now and has not been sustainable for a century. Hmm. And do you think it's likely to change the century? Well, you know, it pretty much has to, right? That you would say that right, that Adam Smith said, and you know, before him, um Adam Ferguson, right, that yeah, you know, the transformation from a feudal society, you know, of you know, peasants and lords to a commercial society. You know, of laborers, entrepreneurs, farmers, and merchants, and landlords, right? Had, you know, that that technological transformation had greatly transformed the entire shape of society. 
Yeah. And then Marx and Engels said, yeah, but now we're headed on to a steam power society, which is as different from, you know, the commercial revolution era society of Smith and Ferguson we're looking back as so that was for feudalism. Um, and yet since Marx and Engels is today, day, we've had, you know, um, the Society of Electricity, Internal Combustion Engines, Airplanes, and Organic Chemical Industries, which is very different from steam power. Mm -hmm. um, we've had the Fordist assembly line and mass production, which is very different from the second industrial revolution. We then had the global value chain economy, and now we're moving into the info biotech economy. And I don't know what's going to happen beyond that. Um, but that we are having lots and lots of changes and transformations in the technological hardware underpinning our society. And so, yes, things are going to change. Things are going to change big time um, and not just in the next hundred years right? that you know, already the transformations in modes of production and communication with the coming of info, the infotech revolutions of the past 30 years have had profound influences on how societies work and not all of them positive. So colloquially, one of the things uh, when we typically speak of utopia is utopia is seen as something mm -hmm. impossible. Um, you know, typically when you propose something, one of the common responses I hear is, it's a very utopian idea. This is not going to work. Why has utopia yes. gotten this sense of being impossible, being unrealistic? Um, and despite that being the case, as an economist, why are you so convinced that utopia is reachable? Um, well, I don't know if we can ever reach utopia. We certainly can move towards it. That you know, utopia has its start with Sir Thomas More saying, this is no place. You know, that he's talk, going to talk about something that is no place, but he's also going to talk about something in which a huge number of things work much better than they worked in the Tudor dynasty, you know, Renaissance England, you know, in which he lived. And indeed, with Plato, it was very much the same thing. We're going to construct the best city in our minds and hope to gain ideas about how to make a better city um, in our world. Um, so I'd say the goal um, is... Definitely, right? The, the goal is definitely there. As is the realization, as is the realization that nothing in this world can be perfect, and we're not smart enough to figure out what a perfect thing is, even if it were possible to actually attain it. Um, and so that's why we have a towards. Um, you know, that's why we have a towards um, when we talk about utopia rather than an act or a reaching or a really existing thing. Mm -hmm. That, you know, when the things that really exist turn out to be dystopias on the one hand. And, you know, when an Aldous Huxley wrote about a near utopia in his book Island, you know, the book ends with the thing being destroyed by, you know, internal and outside political pressures. You know, colonialism and aristocracy and likings for elite domination. So in a way, um, when we are approaching towards utopia, one of the key um, requirements is first, we, we make opportunity equitable, even if not the outcome. And when we speak of equitable opportunity, um, do mm -hmm. you think that allowing equal opportunity or... Um, at least resources for equal opportunity in a way reduces market participation or economic participation of those people who have who have the access to these. Well, though equal opportunity is very hard um, without substantial equality of result right, in one generation. Mm -hmm. That that parents will have enormous interests in giving you know. Um, their children a leg up and so to the extent that there's substantial inequality of wealth you'll find you know a lot of that inequality of wealth then tuned to figuring out how to reproduce itself in the next generation you know and how much you regard this as 
a huge problem as opposed to an inevitable consequence um, and a reason to worry about equality in this generation because you really do want to have equality, approximate equality of opportunity is a very good thing, is an open question. Um, but those have tended to make me feel kind of skeptical of saying, well, you know, we just need to have equal opportunity um, because lots of things in human nature rebel against actually being able to get there. Hmm. And when we speak of, again, um, equitable opportunity here and, and rather a fair distribution of wealth, when we speak of at least democratic countries, income-based taxation uh, is probably one step towards fair distribution of wealth. Would you, would you, yeah. would you think so? And if that is the case, sorry, you were saying, you know, I okay. certainly, I certainly would, um, you know, I would think we would have to do a bunch, um, you know, of progressive taxation, you know, especially, um, especially since, um, especially since, you know, I'm, How shall I put it? Um, you know, that especially since so much of the income and wealth distribution that we see you know, is luck or is very close to being pure luck. That if you go back and if you look at, you know, say, um, the way the computer industry has evolved, you know, it was pure luck that Microsoft and Intel wound up in the one places in the value chain in which they had very little effective competition for a very long time. And thus getting yourself onto the Microsoft or the Intel gravy train made you extremely wealthy and thus able to shape the industry in future generations. Um, you know, that... You know, similarly, like, right, like, um, you know, Netscape, right? Netscape never made a dime, you know, that, you know, Microsoft made sure Netscape never made a dime. Um, and indeed, the only reason why the original investors in and founders of Netscape made any money um, was because other people did not see what was going on. And we're willing to pay vastly in excess um, of what the real value was, given that Microsoft was not going to let them make any money. Um, so that the right that the wealth of say Mark Andreessen are the losses of those who bought the company um, from him and from Jim Clark and others. Um, and so you know, that was a random piece of luck, and it's given Mark Andreessen the cards, the social power to be a player in the future um, of the computing industry. At a hand, I think he has played very, very well, you know, but it was simply luck and the misperception of a bunch of people who did not really understand what Microsoft's attitude toward Netscape was um, that actually gave him that chance. You know, and that kind of luck thing is all over. Um, you know, the world and the distribution of wealth. Yeah. And, you know, you can say, well, gee, there's no way that Mark Andreessen is going to be able to consume anything near his wealth. He's going to invest it in other projects, some of which will return, some of which will be good things financially, some of which will be good things for society, some of the things will be bad things and just flame out. Um, and someone has to make those decisions. And taking resources and assigning them to one smart person is a, not a crazy way to do it. Um, but I do have a very strong sense that, you know, bumpers, guardrails um, on the, given how much of your ability to have social voice in a market society depends on your wealth, you know, there should be very strong bumpers and guardrails to make sure that, you know, most people have some voice and very, very few people have an extraordinarily outsized voice. 
so when you mention voice here, do you necessarily mean uh, ability to influence decisions like in a democracy or is there more to it? Well, I mean, there's social power different from social voice, right? Um, I suppose social voice is more persuading people of things and social power is much more, you know, actually getting things done whether other people agree, you know, or not. Mm. And, you know, you can get things done um, in a democratic process by convincing enough legislators to pass a law that then establishes a bureaucracy with a mission and a budget. Um, or you can get things done in the market economy simply by having money and spending it. Um, and I think those are both, you know, um, Ways, those are both ways in which we can direct society's resources in one generation, one direction or another. Um, and it's very important to try to figure out what are the best social mechanisms for deciding on those direction of societal resources, um, kind of questions and problems. So in a market, uh, free market capital driven world, are you suggesting that corporations and the rather wealthier people should have only either of social voice or social power and not both? Um, certainly Milton Friedman thought so, right? Um, you know, that Milton Friedman thought corporations should buy and sell things in order to, you know, produce profits, in order to make money for stockholders, and otherwise should, should simply shut up. Right, should not attempt to influence, you know, the social voice democracy. What are the laws that get passed, and how are they then executed, um, at all? You know, that simply letting letting the people who ran businesses um, into the business of attempting to persuade what law should be passed had to end very badly. And in doing that, you know, Milton Friedman was very much, you know, echoing Adam Smith, who in an earlier century would go much more strongly and say, you know, the working class is insufficiently educated to have a voice in public decisions. And the mercantile industrial classes are kind of self-interested and destructive. Yeah. And so what you really need is a group of people whose interest is the interest of society as a whole. Um, and those are the landlords, yeah. um, which leads Smith to a kind of weird aristocratic politics in some ways. Um, although he had an egalitarian, very egalitarian theory of what the distribution of wealth should actually be. Mm -hmm. So speaking again, speaking again of taxation, uh, to, a, to a fair degree, we see that, um, you know, corporate corporates are being exempted for, from paying heavy taxes in many countries in the recent times. Uh, while these are the people mm -hmm. who have both social voice and social power, um, yeah. do you think the approach towards taxation, uh, taxation or taxing corporates should change? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm 100% for Janet Yellen's attempts at global corporate tax harmonization. And, you know, it's disappointed that has not moved forward much more rapidly um, than it has. That, you know, especially when you look at things like, say, you know, Purdue Pharmaceuticals or the role played by the tobacco industry in lung cancer epidemic, or say the role of oil companies in resisting taking the lead out of gasoline and in casting quote, doubt, unquote, on the science of global warming. Um, you know, you can't look at that and think that here we have a bunch of organizations that are structured, you know, to actually do a bunch of things that are evil. You know, um, similarly, in the past 48 hours, right, in the Dominion voting lawsuit, you know, we've gotten a bunch of very interesting documents out from, you know, um, about how much Fox News regards itself in the we mislead and terrify our audience so their eyeballs are glued to the screen so we can sell them to advertisers who will sell them fake diabetes cures you know, and overpriced gold funds. Um, 
rather than we are in the business of being citizens conveying information um, to our fellows. Um, and those are all things that are kind of deeply, deeply disturbing, especially as our um, algorithmic powers of grabbing human attention automatically increase. You know? And so it becomes easier to hack humans, people's, humans' brains, not necessarily to their benefit. Hmm. But And where does globalization stand in this entire picture? Do you think globalization is... Uh, hmm helping accelerate such equitable growth or do you think it's impeding? I think deglobalization would be considerably worse, right? Um, that is, deglobalization keeps pretty much all opportunity in the global north. You know, while with globalization, there are a bunch of channels through which opportunity and technology can kind of leak out elsewhere. And so, you know, there's a chance for a less, you know, unequal world. If you have globalization, there's little chance if you have deglobalization. And if that is the case, why do you think um, is there, or, or would you even agree when I say that there's a growing interest among fascists uh, to, to head towards deglobalization? Well, you know, there's... Globalization also produces enormous amounts of social stress, yes. You know, but ev everything, every change produces huge amounts of social stress. And most of the changes that are coming are within country technology and sociology driven changes rather than the global interface. So, you know, but um, if you're running a democratic or even a non-democratic polity, it's much better for you to blame foreigners for whatever has gone wrong, rather than blame one of your constituents or someone else inside your country who is politically very powerful and would make a bad enemy. So I view the reaction against globalization mostly as a safety valve um, by people who want to distract attention for internal flaws in societies that are truly the source of social and economic problems. And do you think it's worth solving or even addressing these internal flaws um, oh, as opposed to, to just... Right? Uh, Carl Polanyi said, as Carl Polanyi said, that most of these internal flaws are related to um, the fact that the market economy, as powered by technology, simply steamrolls over you know, all interests, expectations, and practices, except those that are useful for creating wealth. Um, and if one thing is certain is that society, people will not stand for a world in which the only rights that are ever vindicated and matter are property rights. You know, that unless you deal with those, you're going to find a very bad thing happening to your market, to your prosperous market economy. What the bad thing will be, you know, we do not know. It may be named Joseph Stalin. It may be named Adolf Hitler. Um, it may be something less, you know, less genocidal, but still not very good. But it will be something. Got it. Uh, since you brought up property rights, just a, a thought on that. Do you think property rights um, or, uh, you know, generational property rights should be a thing? And uh, how do you think it affects or uh, supports fair distribution of wealth? What do you mean? What do you mean by generational property rights? Um, it, it's basically people inheriting properties from their parents and you know grandparents and so on. Um, hard to get rid of that. Very hard to get rid of that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, Plato in the Republic tried, right? that people are to be raised in large nurseries without regard to their family background. Um, if only because Plato thought that, you know, breaking up the clan structure of society was essential to have a good one. Um, and that he thought we needed to go that far in order to get rid of the defects of kind of family and clan, you know, indicates how large he thought those kind of defects were. Um, and how powerful they were. So I would say you want to minimize um, 
and you want to create lots of opportunities for mobility and motion and for slippage of one sort or another. You know, that is the Imperial Roman and Republican Roman practice of, you know, frequent, um, you know, frequent and unproblematic adoption, you know, of people at all ages. Um, so much so that I remember the aged Emperor Nero announcing in the forum that he was adopting a 55-year-old general as his son um, <laughs> without telling the guy first. Um, you know, the guy who was going to become the Emperor Trajan. Um, mm. And, you know, I mean, a culture, acculturation mechanisms, you know, by which people go through similar experiences pulling people from different families of different statuses together and giving them collective memories and collective interests, right? Usually getting a bunch of the people together and having them do difficult things in groups, you know, as exercises are, I think, good ways to try to deal with that at a social level. But, you know, again, those are very hard to kind of create and maintain. On a lighter note, so are you just suggesting that the nation be treated like an MBA class, but at a larger scale? Well, except that we've always done that, right? Um, you know, we've always had age groups and thrown them together and had them do things and have separate special tasks associated with it, you know, um, as long back as we can remember. You know, and yes, this is kind of important and this produces a lot of creativity and a lot of cross fertilization, you know. You know, that our big edge is, in fact, that we are potentially an anthology intelligence, right? that each of us on their own, not by their own, is barely smart enough to remember where they put their keys last night. Right? Mm -hmm. But if we talk to each other and if we trust each other, we are amazingly smart and extraordinarily competent and powerful. But in order to talk, we got to have those social network links. So in a way, would you say that one of the bottlenecks of neoliberals is that they cater only to certain age groups and not all age groups? And it might not just have to do with left or right wing approaches. It's rather to do with the age and the demand of the population that they cater to. Yeah, except they used to cater to the relatively young who felt themselves oppressed by bureaucracies um and rigid institutions and now they cater to the relatively old who kind of have something but are scared it's going to be taxed away and so in some ways these are the same people these are the same people they were appealing to in the 1980s they just <laughs> aged so. so in a way thus having a more youth participation within the neoliberal government do you think that that's going to help improve things and if so, how how can you get more uh, youth to participate? Sorry, I missed a garbled word. Having more what within the neoliberal? Having more youth participation. Oh yes, oh yes, definitely. Um, you know, we have more of a you know, much more of a gerontocracy, um, all over the world than is healthy. And if that's the case, how should the participation of youth be improved in the government or in electoral politics? How should youth um, be more know, at the forefront? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, in the info and biotech spheres, we're doing pretty well. But that's simply because technological change is so rapid that, that claims of expertise based on past accomplishments are well regard are regarded as not being worth very much at all. Um, and the problem is wherever the rate of technological progress is slower, you know that um someone who has authority and prestige because of past success is more or less a natural shelling point to coordinate on. You know, which means you get people in their 80s you know, who are still the default choice um, for very important and powerful positions because, you know, they've been around a while and everyone knows them. 
You know, like for example, with Disney, you know, that if you think that Bob Chapek is does not have his finger on the proper pulse of Disney, um, we all you almost certainly want do not want to bring back Bob Iger, you know, because Bob Iger is probably going to try to do what he tried to do 15 years ago. Mm. Because that's who he is, and that's the way he thinks the world works, but the world has moved on. And they would have been much better hunting for someone younger than for hunting for someone older than their current CEO, just because he had been a great CEO at success at the past. Right. So the question still remains, how how can youth become better participants in electoral politics? Hmm. Um, yeah. I'm afraid I have no answer right, to you. The social network, the guy in view, you know, that unless you're lucky to have a, you know, insurgent moment, right? You need a really young and charismatic candidate whose aides are largely people younger than himself to kind of break through. In the United States, you know, we've had only one and a half such um, in the past. God, um... I would say in the past 150 years, right, that um, since life expectancy in America began its substantial upward climb above 45 or so, you know, we've only had John F. Kennedy is the one and Bill Clinton, that's the half mm. in terms of, you know, people who bring about a... Um, a youth moment, um, say a youth renewal moment, you know, otherwise, well, you know, the world you have, you have Donald Rumsfeld was defense secretary in 1976, and Donald Rumsfeld was defense secretary in 2004. Yeah, um, otherwise, the kind of network nature means... Mm -hmm. So again, I'm sorry, I wish I had a better answer. Sure, but how do you think um, Britain was able to transcend beyond these boundaries and quite ironically have a much younger leader at this point? Um, much younger. Um, well, I would say largely because pretty much all of the older people took their reputations and their careers and lit them on fire. Um, you know, there's also this, you know, um, very British thing <clears throat> whereby if you lose too badly, you're supposed to resign and then exit the stage, you know, and not attempt to come back, you know, and I do not understand where that comes from, but that certainly helps yeah, you know, the the circulation, the elite circulation of elites to actually circulate in the United Kingdom. And do you think it makes a difference um, whether you have a parliamentary or a presidential democracy in terms of how these changes pan out, or how uh, well can you cater to the demands of um, the so-called leftists? You would think so, right? That Max Weber thought that parliamentary democracies were superior um, because you needed a charismatic presidential candidate, you know, but the members of parliament would not trust themselves to an incompetent one. Mm -hmm. you know, while in presidential systems, you know, it was charisma rather than competence that was likely to rule and likely to rule extraordinarily. Um, and I must say, I find that argument convincing in theory, but I can't see much empirical evidence that it is in fact true. Okay. So if if you were to become the president of the United States, what would you what would your approach be? Uh, what would you do over the term of four years um, 
to let's just say set the momentum along a different direction or a different trajectory altogether um accelerating towards utopia well you know for personnel i'd say that cabinet secretaries you know should be under 40 and you know assistant secretaries should be under 35 um you know that you know and that it would be tough luck for everyone between 40 and 60 uh, currently <laughs> but that we really do need to kind of skip a generation precisely if we're going to have people who are flexible and appropriately future oriented um as for policies you know well it looks to me like biden is doing the term his team is doing a superb job as far as policies are concerned right that so you know, given all of the political constraints on him, I think the policy menu for is quite, quite good. And do you think immigration laws have any place in this entire discussion of um, fair distribution of opportunities and wealth? Oh, enormous ones, right? That is, you know, I think as Mitt Romney said that where what country you are born in is the principal determinant of what your opportunities are in the world today. Um, and you want to talk about things that are unfair um, at any kind of global sense, that is the one of the most unfair things one can imagine being. So from a country's standpoint, uh, let, let's take United States as an example. Uh, for sure, uh, it's always beneficial to Americans that immigration laws become stricter. But at the same time, uh, in terms of them having Perhaps more access not. to job opportunities. Perhaps not, right? That is... Immigrants, right? Um, immigrants are, are people who think differently than you do and have lots of energy um, are an asset to pretty much any country. And immigrants tend to be, on average, to skew young, so they think different. Um, and people who are willing to move 3,000 miles in pursuit of a better life, especially if they have to overcome bureaucratic obstacles to do so, you know, are very much the kinds of people who you would like to have you know, join your society if they can find a place in which they can fit and feel that they fit. Um, so you mm -hmm. really that you know um, people who care about the quality of the country their grandchildren live in should be much much stronger pro immigrant than they actually are. That, then what do you have to say about this whole narrative of make America great again and uh, you know tougher immigration policies? And oh, as I said, it's something again. Part is the tell. Yeah. Right? That the underlying technologies, you know, are just not there. Um, hmm. You know, that, you know, they really weren't even there in the 1970s when Bruce Springsteen began his career and, you know, began singing about the, you know, angst of the blue collar male who no longer really has a secure place in a society in which you know after the vietnam war manufacturing is no longer the key sector of the economy and you know blue collar unionized manufacturing jobs are no longer incredibly common and easy ladders to career paths you know? i mean springsteen began singing that lament in 1976 you know, and it's soon it will be 50 years. <laughs> um, yeah. And so to say we really want to go, but to wind the clock back to something that has not existed for more than two generations, um, you know, is really strange. It's about like saying what we really need to have is um, King Arthur and a round table of knights who wind out being local judges and righting <laughs> wrongs and a big name Merlin. Right. And, you know, say the both those are about, about both about equally likely of accomplishment. Um and when both are equally likely of accomplishment, what do you think becomes the deciding factor? And more so from the standpoint of running national democracies. 
And I do not know, right? Um, that why keep. Mm -hmm. One one final question, Professor. So we Brad. keep hoping that they keep hoping that we'll develop enough of a societal immune system um, that you know that simply the noise of the net um, will become so large that it will no longer be easy to persuade people of false things in order to make money using computers. Um, and that people will, in fact, become much better in terms of returning to truly trusted, which means personalized information sources, you know, before they will credit much. Um, and I think that would do a lot to make us, you know, less stupid as a species. Uh, got it. Do, do you think we are in the middle of a recession, or are we heading towards a recession? Um, I actually think we're in, we're in the soft landing. Um, that is, I think that the Federal Reserve understands the dilemmas and that we have been lucky enough that it did turn out that inflation was transitory, that nobody took the inflation of 2022 as a signal that inflation would be high in the future. Um, and the oil and energy shocks of Putin's invasion of the Ukraine have turned out to be much less large than people feared. Um, so, yes, there'll be another recession at some point, but I think it's now two, three, four, five years away. Mm -hmm. And um, why do you think the the Ukrainian-Russian um, incident or the interactions was so less effective? What do you think the world did right so that the effects of it effects of the Russian-Ukrainian um, turmoils were not so hard the energy, the energy and also the food value chains have turned out to be much more robust than I thought. You know, okay. that is a very, this is of our globalized high-tech goods production value chain network turned out to be less robust than we thought. There have been much more ability for people to substitute other forms of energy or conservation um for energy that would have come out of russia and you know also for food you know the the world food system has turned out to be very very flexible you know there have been other sources of grain you know, for egypt and for nigeria than that coming out of ukraine which is a great mercy got it so in in a way uh one of the things that has helped us get here is globalization uh in a way globalization has mm -hmm. saved us from from the harder yep. shocks that we might have witnessed. Yep, 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 yep. It's very nice to see. Interesting. And and what do you think is the role of um, wh when we speak of fair distribution of wealth? I previously had Professor Miles Kimball on my podcast, and we were speaking of negative mm -hmm. interest rates uh, as a means to sort yes. of let's say pull countries out of recession or just um, allow people to have more opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, what, so now right. we could have two ways to bring in participation. One is you um, allow more people to participate, that's labor, or uh, you infuse more yes. capital and you let capital do the job. So all this while, when we speak of fair distribution of wealth and uh, equality of opportunities, all we're talking about is labor. Uh, do you think negative interest rates could be one way to allow capital to improve labor participation? Well, it's certainly the people who own capital will scream at it, right? Because it, the negative interest rates, you know, they mean that capital is not itself a return, right? That capital is a place you store your wealth where it gradually gets eaten away. Um, and that the returns go to work, go to labor. But then they also go to risk bearing and entrepreneurship and market position and giving the right campaign contributions so that your monopoly um, over a particular market happens to be entrenched. And, you know, they don't go to capital. That a world of negative interest rates is, in fact, a post-capitalist um, world. It's in some ways much more like the world of the Medici Bank back in 1400. You know, that wealth is not itself a source of income and social power, but a way that social power is stored up from the past to be used in the future. You know, and so to use it um, is to spend down your principal and thus to lose it. 
as opposed to the world of the industrial revolution in which you know the rate of profit is 10% per year and so the possession of wealth is itself an enormous source of social power and of further wealth and hence of an even more dominant position so which of it, which of these do you think is much better uh, when we are slouching towards utopia um i'd say the second i'd say the world of low interest rates is the one we want to have um, and you know john maynard keynes agreed right that he thought that if you could get a central bank that was um focused on low interest rates you would manage to solve the unemployment problem and the income distribution problem at least in the long run you know relatively easily um, and hence his concern for moving people out of gold standard ways of thinking in which you the in which the implicit default policy is one of high interest rates so if so why do you think have we not um, already implemented this at scale across countries why do you think we are not able to drive low interest rates well there are lots of people who do not like low interest rates right um and For there's sure. lots of fear of a return of the 1970s right that the inflation of the 1970s in the global north was a truly civilization mind scarring event and it still leaves its mark on what people think and say today so is it just uh, when you say that it leaves a mark on people's thoughts and perspectives do you think it's just a problem of the generation and uh, the, the moment the the present generation is out of voice and power the next generations are going to be more favorable towards it it's not that easy right it's because even if people did not live through the 1970s they have a memory of what they're told happened in the 1970s and so the memory echoes itself down through um okay i i understand the standpoint that a lot of people might not like um the idea of negative interest rates because it means them losing capital um yes but but like you mentioned uh, what if banks um who who have the opportunity to issue debt ex nihilo um had the power to do so at negative interest rates in which case people aren't losing capital per se but it's more of the nation trying to recover from losses or uh, recession yeah, for the lack of a better word you know the central bank has to enforce that right the central bank has to want to follow a negative interest rate policy um you know because if it doesn't well then you know, why should a bank um you know um why would any if it, the, if it doesn't then the bank will be ineffective right that you know no one will want to lend at a negative interest rate if there's another counterparty that's willing to pay a positive interest rate you know so you really do need to have the world a wash in liquidity and central banks need to make that happen okay and um why do you think central banks do not want to make it happen except for uh, you know their their fear of repeating the 1970s yeah i mean they're scared of inflation um, that is they think that above all else a central banker is a failure um if they preside over a time of inflation and so they're always leaning they tend to lean the wrong too far in that particular direction do you think international lending or you know borrowing internationally is one way to solve this or if not why it hasn't been um you know that the global financial market really seems to be the us financial market writ large with the you know, peculiar problems of potential financial crisis and inflationary spirals in emerging market economies added on to it you know that i mean you'd think that globalized financial markets would be less risky uh, but instead they seem to be more risky that you know that that people's tendency to to converge on a common set of global expectations and thus herd behavior on the part of asset managers and owners um those who have to demand to hold the assets seems to outweigh the um 
the actual diversification because the fundamental supply side shocks in the global in a global world in a globalized world are less than in an in individual country because they're attenuated across countries you know and that's a problem that i do not really understand why it's the case but that seems to be the case interesting so when we when we look at this increasing momentum towards or at least increased enthusiasm towards decentralized finance in the last two to three years um mm -hmm. it, it seems to be contradicting to the case that you just made uh where you say that globalization of financial markets is possibly not the best um approach to go ahead with um but, but still there is enough um reasons why people would prefer decentralized finance in terms of just reducing the number of players that that um or reducing the number of stakeholders that influence uh any activity that happens in the financial market uh yeah, but and, once again, if you block off globalized finance, you then create enormous profit opportunities for people who find a way to root themselves around um, that blocking off. You know, so would you the, say that decentralized finance is still as the need of the warned, and as Friedrich, as Friedrich von Hayek said, the market is a very powerful way of dissolving regulations that try to constrain it. You know, simply because of, there's money to be made up huge numbers of people are then incentivized to think about how they could, you know, um, get around these particular regulations. So would you say that decentralization of be it uh, governance or finance is, is something that's better when we are slouching towards utopia? Um, I would say we still do not know. I would say the problems of financial regulation and organization are among the things that flummox us most badly, you know, that we understand the system we're in less well about how to properly organize it there than pretty much anywhere else. Yeah. But at the end of the day, aren't regulations, again, just an outcome of uh, governance? Yeah, but it's governance in the interest of the politically powerful. And governors move in a mental universe that's very close to that of investors. Yeah. Okay. Um, that if investors think something is probably good and profitable for the country and the world, the people in charge of regulating are probably going to think that too. And why do you right, think no, there's overlap? I have a hard stop in seven minutes, right? That is, oh, I need sure. to get off at 9.30. Okay. okay. So. Um, th that's okay. We can conclude this here. Um, All right. Any, any concluding thought that you had to share? Um, simply that in most ways, it is an absolutely marvelous world, right? That our technological competence continues to expand at a remarkable and overwhelming pace giving us access to miracles of communication, organization, and of nature manipulation that vastly outstrip anything previous generations thought was likely. Um, and our problems, our biggest problems, are that we are so lousy at using you know, our collective wealth as an anthology intelligence, um, rather than that we have reached the end of the process by which advancing technology increases our potential power to organize ourselves productively and to manipulate nature to make our lives better. Got it. One, one final question, Professor Brad. If you were a 20-year-old out of college, fresh grad, what would you be do doing today? If I had what? If you just graduated out of college, what would you do if you were 22, 23 years old? If I spoke Chinese, I would head for Shenzhen and start trying to figure out how to make something very small, electronic and interesting. Um, okay, and why is that? In the United States, I think I would probably head for Boston and try to figure out you know, how to get in and start doing something biotechnological mm -hmm. that would be interesting and beneficial to humanity. Yeah that, you know, that it seems to me that there are three big opportunities. There's the biotech opportunity, which is in Boston and lots of other places. There is the micro hardware opportunity, which is Shenzhen. And then there's figuring out how to actually write software, 
<laughs> that is kind of <laughs> useful. <laughs> um, and alas, I don't see anyone who anywhere who's figured out figuring out how to do that. Got it. Thanks. Thanks a lot for okay. sharing your um, thoughts, perspectives, Professor Brad. Oh. Really enjoyed this discussion. You're very welcome. Yes. Thanks for inviting me. Um, thank you. Thank you and for being here. Now finish read finish. Everyone should finish reading my book, Slouching Towards Utopia, and then write to me and tell me what I got wrong in it. Got it. The link will be in the comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. This um, has been a great pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure speaking to you.